put up the first talk and then let's go. <laughs> Always leave the clicker here, please. Hey. Um. Just a minute. <laughs> I can already start. Like I there we go. So, so uh, this is about a little tool that I've developed for quite a long time, but I haven't actually really advertised it a lot. And uh, lately, I've thought like I should make it a bit more usable for more people and maybe make it a bit more well known. So um, the thing is like you have web applications. So uh, maybe you you run. A, a personal web page or a company web page or whatever, a blog with one of these popular content management systems or other web applications. Um, and yeah, sometimes they have security vulnerabilities. Um, and then maybe you forgot to update them, um, and that's bad, and then you get hacked, and then I don't know, you, then you have some JavaScript that's mining cryptocurrency, and, and you're sending spam and, and all these things, and, or maybe you're hosting phishing pages now, which you don't want. Uh, that's all quite annoying, and maybe your web hoster will then tell you that, I don't know, you, he will shut down your web page. It's, yeah. So you should better update. Uh, you, or you should use WordPress. Um, I, I'd like to say this. Uh, WordPress has kind of a bit of a bad reputation. I think WordPress is definitely the most secure content management system you can get because it has automatic updates. Um, but uh, let's assume you run a server for, for other users, which I actually do, and, and you want to know if your users update their web applications because it's also annoying for you as a server admin if, if you send spam or whatever. Um, so you would like to check if your users actually update their web applications. And that's where you need free WBS, which is the tool I developed for this. Uh, so this is kind of how it works. So you run it and give it a path, and then it will tell you, oh, it seems there's a Joomla version 3.9.11, and that has a known security vulnerability. And there's also a Nextcloud and a MediaWiki also with known security vulnerabilities. Um, yeah. So. Um, that's kind of how it works in the back end. That's the, the data that it has in this example, MediaWiki. So uh, uh, I, I, I maintain this myself. People often are curious. And yeah, they, I manually do this, but it's not as much work as people think. Um, so it knows that it, there's a safe version, and there are some older branches that are also safe versions. There's a vulnerability, and then there's uh, some information how to detect the version. So if there's a file default settings PHP that contains a variable VG version, um, then, it, then that means there's a media wiki in that version. Um, so uh, it's actually 12 years old, so I've been doing this for quite some time. Um, it's free software under a CC0 license, which means you can do with it whatever you want. Uh, it's written in Python, uh, uses some uh, string matching and regular expect, uh, expressions, which is a bit ugly, but there's no better way to do it. Um, uh, and then compares it to data about vulnerable versions. Um, yeah. So uh, please try it. Uh, and also, like I, as I said, I tried to make it more usable. You can now install it via pip. But there's also some design decisions where I'm not really sure how to do it yet, particularly about the data and how to update that. If you're good at Python and want to discuss how to best do that or discuss improvements, please come to me, talk to me, and please try it out. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So next up is Pocket Science Lab. Hello, good morning. My name is Mark. Um, I'm a software developer. I'm talking about hardware, which uh, may sound a little bit strange. Um, but I'll explain that um, in a few seconds. Um, Pocket Science Lab is a little hardware which lets you measure all kinds of things. Um, and um, why I like to use it, um, you see here, um, this is my set little lab, um, which yeah, I have to get out of the boxes in the evening, um, play around with microcontrollers, and um, yeah, put it back into the boxes again when I'm done, because this is also the table where my family eats breakfast, where my wife 
has a home office where my son likes to play Legos. Um, yeah, and where I like to play with hardware. Um, I don't have much room to have an oscilloscope or stuff like that, and that's why I'm happy to have found um, this pocket science lab device thing. Um, you use it um, by connecting it to your computer or to your smartphone um, via USB. Um, Wi-Fi connection is currently being um, developed. Um, hope to see that soon. Um, you install software. Um, I'll come to that later. And um, then you just connect things um, to the Pocket Science Lab with um, cables with little pins. Um, so you, if you like to um, play with Arduinos or ESP32s or things like that, um, you stay in your little um, pins and cables world and it all connects to, together um, quite nicely. Um, yeah, the software has um, different screens for the different use cases. Um, it also has help screens. So if you're clueless as me, um, you can just um, take a look at the help screen and it tells you how to connect things, how you can me measure things, um, or just what you can do with the device. Um, you can get the software from the website, um, pslab.io, um, but you can also get it um, the, the software for the phone. You can get it from um, Google Play Store or from, from F-Droid. Um, yeah, what can you do with it? Um, you can substitute an oscilloscope, multimeter, or logic analyzer. Um, maybe if you're like me, uh, you don't have much space. Um, you just need a small device, or, you're, or you travel a lot, um, and you don't want to carry a lot of things with you. Um, then you can create test data with a wave generator. Um, you have a programmable power source. Or you can just um, look at things um, by connecting sensors. And um, yeah, you can either display um, values from the sensors, or you can log it and um, analyze it later. Um, I forgot to say, um, I'm not a developer, developer of the device. I'm only a user, and I'm happy to have found it. So um, if you like the device, um, if it looks interesting, just come to the First Asia assembly. It's in Hall 2. Um, they have devices there. They have um, cables. They have sensors. Um, you can play around with it. Um, you can buy it if you want. You can maybe get tips how to build it yourself. Because it's open hardware, you can build it yourself. The firmware is free. Everything is free. Um, yeah, they will be there until midnight, they told me. Um, so if you like the device or would like to take a look, um, just go there and have a look. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is JMAP LTT RS. Hi, I'm Daniel. Um, so I originally got interested in this a couple of years back. I was um, trying to finally self-host my own email. And I was looking for an email client for Android that provided a similar user experience to uh, Gmail, and I couldn't find any. So I thought, how hard can it be to write your own? Um, that led me to look into email, which, in, in case you don't know, is the uh, protocol most email clients use to fetch email from your server. Um, so it turns out email is a uh, IMAP is a little bit of a mess. Um, uh, it's an extensible protocol, and you need a bunch of server-side extensions to provide a good user experience. Uh, but as a client, you're also expected to uh, deal with servers that don't have um, those extensions, and that makes your client um, code quite bloated. Um, furthermore, IMAP doesn't use any of the well-established serialization formats uh, like JSON or XML. Uh, so you cannot even use a stock uh, library to pass the wire format. Um, and uh, yeah, even if you get all, through all that mess, uh, you still have to do a deal with MIME parsing, which is uh, another complicated thing. And um, yeah, and also like sending emails requires yet another protocol. Um, so luckily, there's an alternative to that called JMAP. Um, so what is JMAP? JMAP basically is IMAP with all the cool extensions. Um, 
and it will also make the server deal with all the MIME parsing. So as a client, you basically get a JSON structure uh, with the email data that is essentially ready to display to the user. Um, it's also uh, stateless and doesn't require persistent TCP connection because you may hate that uh, mobile phone vendors are preventing uh, apps from keeping a uh, persistent TCP connection in the background, but you just have to deal with that, and that's just how it is. Um, so from a client developer's perspective, JMAC makes a lot of things a lot easier. Um, however, it's still really fully compatible to IMAP, so it can operate in the same data structure on the server, and you can just as well use an IMAP client and a JMAP client in parallel. And obviously, the server-to-server uh, -server communication remains untouched as well. Uh, so that what was what, me, what got interested me in, in uh, JMAP, but it's not all what JMAP is. So JMAP really is a data synchronization protocol. Uh, more of a replacement for active sync than, than just for IMAP, and in the future it will also be able to ha handle calendars and contacts and so on. Uh, so what JMAP isn't, it's, you still have to deal with some of the legacy mess of IMAP and email, for example, like text emails with HTML emails. Um, it won't provide a big uh, noticeable difference for end users, because if you already have a well-functional JMAP client, um, you won't know the difference as a user, but from a um, client developer's perspective, this makes a lot of things a lot of easier. And yes, that's what I did. I wrote, wrote a client that's really not a lot of code. Um, it's based on, on a JMAP library that I wrote as well, uh, that acts essentially as a headless email client. So it handles everything an email client would normally do except for the UI, uh, like sending emails, um, archiving emails, marking something as read or flagging, unflagging. And the app itself is really uh, limited, like no frills, no settings. Um, I'm not planning to introduce any setting screen at all because settings always uh, invite feature creep and I don't want that. Um, it's heavily inspired by Gmail. Um, the same backend in the end could potentially also power um, a command line client. Um, so yeah, what, what can you do with it? You can read text emails, you can process emails, um, like marking something as red or flagging or marking it um, a, as important. Um, you can write emails and there's some light responding, like you can respond to an email and it will like, match the proper email IDs. Um, but it won't quote the email. Um, unfortunately, the biggest hurdle, if you want to try it, um, the only server software that supports this is Cyrus and only the unstable Git version. Uh, Dovecut, which I'm sure a lot of you are running, uh, is interested but hasn't started the work on it um, as we are running out of time. Um, I'm still looking for people to help me out with this project, and um, I'm available on Congress if you want to meet, and here are some links that you might want to check out. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Batch Magic. Yes. Hello. Okay, so this is really a great lightning talk session because we are early, right? Awesome. Good job, guys. So, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity here to share a few updates uh, about uh, our project Batch Magic. So, uh, right, it's a wireless project, and as we all know, wireless, that's magic. So, you can magically create text and clip arts on LED name badges uh, using Bluetooth. That's what we're doing with the batch here. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Um, you charge it uh, through a uh, battery uh, through USB, um, so it's a it's a batch and uh, it can be accessed through Bluetooth. Uh, what we are doing, um, developing an Android app, and also we are looking like to develop more and more apps on all the other um, uh, clients like desktop or um, iOS and uh, so on. So what's the story behind it? Um, we found these cool badges everywhere and everyone loves light and blinky things and we see a lot of this here at the Congress. Um, but uh, like we had this app here and this app is uh, like mixed Chinese, is colorful even though the badge is just like one color um, and there are a lot of issues with this and uh, a lot of people wanted to do new things with it. So um, we thought how can we develop an open source app 
And we, we have a large community, but it's often like front-end developers or it's like people who know about server setups and so on, and uh, not so many people who really like uh, hack and decode things. But then we were really happy because we found um, this guy here. Um, so on, um, yeah, on, on Hacker News and everywhere, so there was a guy who said like, let's reverse engineer uh, the LED name badges here uh, using Bluetooth, and he really did it. He put up a blog post, and uh, just like in the great hacker spirit, then also put it uh, here online on GitHub and uh, shared his work, right? And as we often see here also at the Congress, there's so many cool ideas, but actually often the, um, like a lot of hackers have the spirit, uh, I hacked it, it's working for me, it's working on my machine, here's the code, do what you want, and they move on. But uh, for us it's also really nice because we have conferences like the FOSS Asia Summit or the Open Talk Tech Summit in Berlin, and we want really like everyone to be able to use these um, badges. So what we did now is um, we made a call in the community here that we're working with. For example, I'm many years in Singapore and Vietnam and we built this awesome community here around the FOSS Asia free and open source solutions. It's not just software, now also hardware. And we said, hey, now we have this hack. Let's make an app for it. So we invited everyone and people showed up, right? So we have this app now and yesterday I had some comments here of people who said, oh yeah, this is really polished, it, uh, it looks really like a nice thing. And of course, uh, it's on F-Droid, it's on Play Store, we still like a lot of things to solve and make it smoother and so on, but like most of it works. And we also had it already at the camp. And uh, yeah, really nice, you can have clip arts, um, you can have different directions to show the text and so on, and uh, yeah, do a lot of things. Uh, you can make it slower, you can make it faster, and um, write all kinds of text. So, some developments have happened in the recent months, for example, let's say you really make uh, your badge and you create a lot, you make a clip art and you know, you make it really nice and you want to share it with um, your partner or with your friends and so on. So we implemented um, now um, export badges to one device, share your configuration. Why not? Import, export. Um, then also a nice thing is that the original app doesn't have is drawing things. So you can now uh, uh, have a drawing mode where you draw on the badge and then you can have it as a, a badge kind of um, feature. And there can be a lot of more things that we can do here uh, as well. And of course, like as you can imagine, we had crashes. So we fixed a lot of crashes. Interestingly, like most of the developers who joined were like from uh, Vietnam and Malaysia and so on, and they don't use um, non-Latin scripts. Yeah, so. Uh, Interestingly, it was a Chinese origin, but we didn't support non-Latin scripts, so we started to do that. We fixed a lot in this direction also, so adding more and more scripts. So get in touch with us here on GitHub, on the channel, or join our Code Heat contest, which we have. This is how we also like invite more people to participate um, in our projects here at FOSS Asia. Um, it's a coding contest where, for example, the winners could win a trip to the Singapore event um, in March every year. This is also like batch magic. We just added this project into this contest. Now the question is, what is next? Of course, talk to us. Um, we have um, uh, uh, like a, uh, in Hall 2 um, in the decentralization cluster and assembly with FOSS Asia, and we want to do a lot more things. For example, what you see here, um, I, I hope you can uh, recognize this, is like this kind of small fan, and these fans can have different words on it. Uh, why not do this as a next fun project, maybe even add it here into the app where you can configure these fans. Uh, why not do iOS? I personally don't use iOS, but interestingly here at the Congress, so many people use iOS, so I think we should have an iOS app, and some people actually just started, so if you want to join, just join us as well. And of course, we need the hardware to be open. We have a lot of open hardware projects in FOSS Asia. With Batch Magic, some people say, oh, that's too simple for me. I'm not interested. But maybe somebody is interested to join this. And let's make really the hardware itself also open. And that would be cool. For Thank you very much. Join us Ruth. in Hall 2. Thank you. Next up is Path Auditor. 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 There you go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cyril. I usually like memory corruption bugs, but today in this talk, I want to talk to you about something a little bit else, a different class of vulnerabilities that I thought deserves a little bit more love and show you how you can find them yourself. Um, because in the end, as long as it gives you a shell, that's okay for us. Um, so I will talk about privilege escalation bugs. So just imagine what happens if you have this. Um, this is called run by some process which is running as root on your Linux box and it's doing rename 
tenfu bar x, tenfu bar to tenfu bar x. So the first thing you might notice here is, well, this doesn't make any sense. You can't move a directory into itself. Like, how is that supposed to happen? Um, but the fun part about it is, this is actually a privilege escalation vulnerability. Um, and to understand why, we will have to take a quick look at what the kernel is actually doing. So the kernel will get the syscall. It will, it will take the first part argument first and will resolve it. So it goes to slash, then temp, foo, bar. It takes a reference to this file. It could be a file or directory. It, the kernel doesn't know at this point. And then it goes on to the second one. And that's the same thing again, right? So you just slash, temp, foo. But on Linux, there are these things called symlinks. So what if a user can actually write to this directory and just replace this bar with a symlink at this point in time? Then the kernel will follow it, go to etc, for example, and move the file that it got before and move it to a different directory. So if this is running as root, this is bad, right? Because just imagine um, a user can mess with this and move an arbitrary file to etc cron, for example, and get it executed later as root. So um, there are two caveats to this that I want to that I want to mention, which is number one, rename only works with um, if it's on the same file system, it will not move across file system boundaries. Um, so if temp is just a regular directory, it will work. If it's a temp of s, it will not, this case will not work. Um, the other thing is temp is usually a sticky directory, and symlinks uh, are a little bit special in si sticky directories. But this doesn't apply since we are two directories deep. Um, in any case, you might wonder why I'm using such a complicated example because, like, this class of bug, there's such much better examples than this that are much easier to understand. But, well, this was actually a real bug. Uh, there's a tool called TempReviewer which is trying to delete all files in temp and was doing exactly this to find out if something, something is a mount point. So now we want to find these kind of issues at scale to get them fixed, right? Um, so there's a very simple idea that works surprisingly well in practice, which is well, we can just hook all the functions. What if we can just install hooks on every process on the system running as root, take every function in the libc, like open, rename, whatever it is, um, just hook the function, and whenever you call it, you check the path, you, see, you, you try to figure out, can this path be somehow messed with by, by a user, because that might be unintended side uh, uh, consequences, like there might be unintended side effects. Of course, it, it depends a little bit how the value is used, what, this is, what the, the function call is in the end, but it's usually, it's usually a bug if this happens. So we wrote this tool, um, me and the coworker Marta, um, and you can try it out. It works like this. You build this library, libpath auditor it's called. Um, you can use LD preload. So the way it works is um, use LD preload. This allows you to load the library into another process. And then we can overwrite open, rename, and so on. And then just um, check if the path is, could be, uh, have a vulnerability like this. And then afterwards, if it does, we just log it to syslog. And then you will have afterwards to check out the syslog, find all the alerts, and then look at them manually. But usually these are very fun because they always have these tricky side effects. For example, there was one case where a shell script was trying to cut a PID file to check if a process is still alive and kill it. But then if you cut an arbitrary file and follow symlinks, you might end up putting the content of the file into the, into the arguments, and the arguments are visible by every other process on the system, so you, will, you would leak arbitrary files with this. So there's some really cool bugs in this. So long story short, you can find it on GitHub. If you have any questions, you can, you can ping me on Twitter, or I will be um, at the CTF area most of the time. And I'm really sorry. I just noticed the build is broken. I will try to fix it as soon as possible. Um, but in the meantime, just you have to fix up the includes like you see on the bottom. Just remove the third party mention, and then everything will, should work out of the box. If not, just let me know, and uh, I can help you try to debug it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next up is. Uh this talk, I'm interested how they spell it. I'd say Arschlottl, but uh, let's see. Okay, my talk is about Axolotl. Axolotl. It's this uh, small animal living in Mexico City, but it's nearly dying because of environmental issues. But Axolotl is also the encryption mechanism that is used in the signal messenger. 
it, it's actually renamed to double rated uh, at the moment. But Axolotl is also the app I am programming. <coughs> it's a cross platform signal client. It works uh, on nearly all operation platforms. It's written in Golang with a uh, um, Vue.js, HTML, JavaScript front end. And you can send message, link signal desktop, create groups, uh, send and receive attachments. Um, little history. It was developed by a developer that worked for uh, Canonical during his ta during the Ubuntu Touch free of in Canonical. Um, it's a little bit. It was difficult when I took on the maintenance of the app because it wasn't documented the uh, build process and it wasn't also not. Um, supported by the standard way of uh, writing apps for Ubuntu Touch. So I took over. Um, I included uh, Golang support for Ubuntu Touch. Um, I added database uh, encryption. I added system notification. Um, I still had the problem that that um, on start of the app, the whole database was loaded in the, in memory, and so the it was really unresponsive when you have 10,000 messages that are loaded. And also, we got in contact with Open Whisper to support the Ubuntu Touch or an alternative push client to get push messages. But unfortunately, they only support uh, Google and Apple. Um, this summer, I decided to rewrite the front end um, and rename it again. Um, it improved a lot. Um, we have a really responsive um, user interface now, but uh, Open Whisper is still not um, interested in supporting alternative push clients. But if someone uh, is interested, we can do a merge request on the Signal server um, GitHub. It's, I think it's only a few hundred lines of code, so it would be possible to do it. Um, here are some screenshots. Um, the first one is um, uh, still a SQML app. Uh, this is this is how it works on Ubuntu Touch, but I I made it also working on Windows and on Raspberry Pi and everywhere. And you can register. And I still need some help because uh, I want to package it and bring it uh, to to more people that that you can use it. Um, I need also people for the different systems to test it because I, I don't use Windows, for example, so it's always I'm missing some OSs for testing. And I also need help in uh, some decryption functions that are only in the Java code of the Signal app, and I need to translate it to Golang to show, for example, profile images or prove the identity, the Signal identity. That's it. You can try it. It's in the, uh, since some days, it's in the Snap Store. So you can install a snap package, or you can download it from the sources, a build it yourself, or I have also the Windows build on, on GitHub. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Congress design on an oscilloscope. Yes, hello, I'm Quanten, and I've brought our Congress design to an oscilloscope. So what do we have? We have this wonderful Congress design with the cracking characters from LeapTrack. And we have this Congress uh, design generator, which is used to let uh, these characters fall down and create cracks. And this is in our um, motto of the Congress and resource exhaustion. And I thought these cracks and these sharp outlines would be perfect on a vector display. Each magnificent outline 
burned into phosphor. So I decided to uh, put it onto an oscilloscope. So um, what do I need for that? Well, I need the path data of the outline in XY samples, because an oscilloscope uses simply an uh, electron beam to burn images on phosphor, and you need an X axis to deflect the beam in the one direction, and then another axis for the other direction. And then I need a, a path to get this data out of the browser JavaScript into the oscilloscope, because I'm not running on the same machine. So PaperJS is a library which all this uh, generator is built around. It's very nice. It's featureful, wonderful to create animations. And it was really easy. You just need a for loop and go along the path and get all the points you need along the path. So you, I calculate I need maybe 1,000 points. So the path is so long. I go long and have an uh, array of the points. So in the audio part, I used uh, an audio output to put it onto a oscilloscope. And there is a full featured web audio API in JavaScript. You have modular routing, input output nodes, effect nodes. So you can basically mix music in your browser while you're mining bitcoins. And I <laughs> doesn't not, uh, notice it until now, but it's kind of great. But it's JavaScript. But we are as, uh, at resource exhaustion, so it's maybe OK. And yes, it's very easy, actually. You create an audio buffer source, put in both channels, and then they will pop out of your headphone jack. So all you need to do left is to connect your oscilloscope to your um, mm, headphone jack, and you get in full uh, the image. You see on the left side my uh, laptop, and the right side the uh, oscilloscope. I've created a small amplification circuit. It's not that important. And I don't have a video now here, but it's live. So you can look at the oscilloscope live where the characters are falling and breaking apart. And you also see some distortions in the um, oscilloscope image because I don't care about the passes between the characters and all that like that. I will give another uh, longer talk in German today at 1945 at the Karlsruhe stage. It's a non-recording stage, so be sure to come around if you want to have a bit more background. I will uh, explain how all these have a history, a bit more details on how you can implement it, and give an outlook what you can else do with this wonderful combination of PaperJS and, and Web Audio API. So today, in 1945, in German, sadly. Um, if you have any questions, ask me. I'm Quanten, and you will find me at the car soon. Or you can uh, ask me on Twitter, uh, at Quintus Quanten. Call me up, or have a look at the wiki page. I don't know how it's named. I think it's Brothers on Phosphor. And there you can also find everything you need to get in touch with me. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next up is, are you ready to sustain it? This talk is going to be in German. Hallo Kongress, ich bin schon wieder zu klein für den Screen. Um, mein Talk geht über Nachhaltigkeit in Software, ein derzeit häufig gehörter Begriff Nachhaltigkeit. Er kommt eigentlich Klicker aus der Forstwirtschaft, ist relativ alt, nicht eine deutsche Erfindung oder eine europäische Erfindung, gibt es eigentlich überall, wo es Holz gibt, weil Holz seit sehr langer Zeit eine knappe Ressource ist. Die Phönizier haben Nordafrika abgeholzt, die Venezianer haben den Willebit und Kroatien abgeholzt, die ähm, vor den Römern, wer war da in Mesopotamien, haben den Libanon abgeholzt, also Holz war überall begehrt. Jetzt macht man das nicht mehr, jetzt achtet man darauf, dass man aus dem Wald nur so viel pro Jahr herausnimmt, wie in einem Jahr wieder zuwächst. Das ist der Grundgedanke von Nachhaltigkeit. Den hat unter anderem die Bits- und Bäume-Konferenz letztes Jahr versucht, in die Softwareindustrie oder in die IT zu übertragen, hat dazu Naturschutz- und Umweltverbände eingeladen und einige Nachhaltigkeitskriterien aufgestellt. Auch die Bundesregierung kümmert sich um das Thema mit einem parlamentarischen Beirat. Die Schweiz hat Ähnliches. Ich denke, solche Initiativen gibt es, über, naja, nicht überall, aber äh, häufiger. 
die dann jeweils Kataloge, Kriterien für was ist Nachhaltigkeit in Software aufstellen. Auch die katholische Kirche hat sich um Nachhaltigkeit gekümmert. In Hardware-Produktion ist es auch gewandert. Nun, was sind die Probleme? Die Probleme sind, wenn große Organisationen Dinge tun, dann wandert die Komplexität der Organisation in das Ergebnis. Das sagt Conway. Parkinson wiederum sagt, Software füllt immer sämtliche Ressourcen auf, braucht alles auf, verhält sich wie ein Gas, füllt den kompletten Raum. Und Techniker neigen dazu, technische Lösungen toll zu finden, vor allem wenn sie kompliziert sind. Das stellt Don Norman fest, das stellt Stephen Krug fest oder auch Eric Evans in der einschlägigen Fachliteratur. Und Komplexität scheint irgendwie beeindruckend zu sein und gut anzukommen. Das ist nicht gut, wenn es um die Reduktion von Komplexität geht, damit Dinge einfach werden. Unterfüttert wird das Ganze von der Möglichkeit, das zu tun, weil Moores Gesetz seit 50 Jahren circa exponentielles Wachstum bringt. Das heißt, es war nie vernünftig, sparsam zu sein, weil ja in kürzester Zeit die Hardware, die schlecht programmierte Software doch noch abgestützt hat. Das hat bereits vor 25 Jahren dem Niklaus Wirth überhaupt nicht gefallen. Der hat einen Aufsatz, äh, die Software-Explosion, vorgelegt. Den gibt es auch auf Englisch, weil das deutsche, der deutsche Vorläufer ist leider vom Springer Verlag nicht digitalisiert. In der GI-Bibliothek äh, gibt es nur die Referenz auf den Artikel, aber nicht den Artikel selbst. Das Englische, das er ein Jahr später gehalten hat, gibt es aber beim Daniel Bernstein auf der Webseite als äh, tolerierte Raubkopie wahrscheinlich. Auch Dijkstra hat das Problem angesprochen, also die Komplexität als wachsendes Problem. Software kann nur existieren, weil die Hardware so unglaublich zunimmt in ihrer Leistungsfähigkeit. Nun, was kann man da tun? Gibt es verschiedene kleine und Einzelorganisationen und Einzelpersonen, die versuchen da Alternativen aufzuzeigen. Ich denke aber, es hilft nur einen radikalen Schritt zu machen und zu sagen, Software muss ohne Wachstum auskommen. Das heißt, meine heutige Software, die ich toll finde und gerne benutze oder die ich gebaut habe oder gerade baue, muss, um zukunftssicher zu sein, auch auf alter Hardware laufen können. Und da ist fünf Jahre ein ziemlich großer Zeitraum und lustigerweise auch das gleiche Kriterium beim ganz neuen blauen Engel für Software, der auch verlangt, dass Software auf fünf Jahre alten Systemen laufen kann. Weil nur dann ist glaubhaft, dass diese Software ohne Wachstum der zugrunde liegenden Hardware-Ressourcen benutzt werden kann und keine Neuinvestitionen von Hardware erfordert. Das ist der, der Grund. Software ist der Treiber für Hardware-Investitionen. Zu dem Thema möchte ich heute Abend zu einer Diskussion einladen in der Vintage Computer, äh, im Vintage Computer Cluster um 8 Uhr. Äh, wer Zeit und Lust hat, über dieses Thema zu streiten, äh, das auch was Positives beizutragen, destruktiv zu sein, zu randalieren, was auch immer, äh, würde mich sehr interessieren, wenn ihr vorbeikommt, mir eure Meinung sagt, wie kann IT-Industrie Nullwachstum erreichen. Herzlichen Dank für eure Aufmerksamkeit. Einen schönen Kongress und wascht euch die Hände. Danke. Thank you. So, next up is Free Pascal. Ja. Hello together, my name is Pascal Dragon. I am a developer of the Free Pascal compiler and I'd like to give you a quick overview of this uh, open source cross-platform object Pascal compiler. Quick history, uh, it was originally started by Florian Klempfel on H2 1993, uh, originally written in Turbo Pascal and targeted the Go uh, 32 version 1 DOS extender. Thus it was a 16-bit uh, application generating 32-bit code. In 1995, the compiler was able to compile itself, thus became a 30-bit uh, application as well. Soon after, the first ports to other operating systems like Linux and OS2, as well as the first other CPU, namely the Motorola 68000, followed. In 2005, uh, FreePascal was the first uh, open source compiler for Windows 64 because we had our own uh, internal linker and assembler, as the GNU binotils weren't ready yet. FreePascal is an open source compiler. The compiler and the tools are licensed as GPL version 2 or newer. 
uh, while the RTL and the code library is licensed as LGPL version 2 with a static linking exception. This allows closed source applications to statically link against the RTL and the code library without violating the license. FreePascal is a cross-platform compiler. We support various processor architectures, for example, x86 in 16, 32, and 64-bit flavors, ARM in 32 and 64-bit, PowerPC in 32 and 64-bit, the Motorola 68000. Our youngest target is the RISC V, also with 32 and 64-bit support, and we also support AVR with, as an 8-bit uh, target. And uh, we also support the JVM as a backend, which includes Android, and we have a WebAssembly backend in development. And as a speci speciality, we have a Pascal to JavaScript transpiler in the form of the tool Pass2.js. We also support a variety of uh, operating systems. This includes uh, the big windows in 32 and 64-bit, Windows CE, or formerly called Windows Mobile, also Windows 3.11. We support various Unix-like systems, like Linux, Mac OS X, or nowadays Mac OS, uh, as well as uh, Free Open Net and Dragonfly BSD. We support the Amiga-likes, namely Amiga 3.x on the Motorola 68000, Amiga 4.x on the PowerPC, MorphOS, as well as ROS. We also support various other operating systems, like OS2, DOS, with and without a DOS extender, the Atari ST, um, Mac OS Classic, and various gaming platforms by Nintendo, namely Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS, Nintendo Wii, and the Switch through a third-party developer. And we also support developing on uh, bare-bone hardware, um, which is mostly used for the IVR and ARM. Free Pascal is an object Pascal compiler. We support various existing language dialects through a mode concept, which allows to select the language modes per compilation unit. We cover various existing dialects like Turo Pascal, Delphi, Mac Pascal, as well as the two um, Pascal standards, ESO Pascal and extended ESO Pascal. We also have two custom dialects uh, that are similar to the Turo Pascal and Delphi uh, dialects, but have a few differences and restrictions. Uh, Free Pascal has a namespace module-like concept through units, which allows for fast compilation, which is also why C++ developers want that. Um, as the name says, this is an object-oriented uh, programming language. We have virtual methods, interfaces, a class meter type, something I really miss from C++ sometimes. Um, we have extensive runtime type information, which is the basis for an IDE like Lazarus uh, to retrieve information about the running code at runtime. And we also support uh, generics, which uh, are a bit of a hybrid between um, C++ templates and C Sharp Java generics. If I've made you curious, uh, give it a try. The current release is uh, 3.04. At you can download it at freepascal.org for various platforms. Uh, I'd also suggest you to use the Lazarus IDE uh, in version 2.06, which you can get at lazarus-ide.org. You can also, if you have questions, talk to me on the Congress. I should be recognized there plenty But that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is the Telnet Challenge, aka Winkelkatzen Challenge. It's going to be a German talk. Uh, hello, my name is Dario. Um, wir sind eine Assembly. Du kannst die Folien auch da unten ja, sehen. Ja. Ich bin so klein. Wir sind eine Assembly, nee, wir sind eine Assembly ähm, die sich hier auf dem ähm, Kongress gegründet hat und seit drei Jahren eine Assembly ist. Wir haben uns ähm, am 30. C3 das erste Mal getroffen und haben so grob zusammengesessen an einem der freien Tische. Und ähm, seit drei Jahren machen wir eine eigene Assembly, um so der Community ein bisschen was zurückzugeben, um irgendwas zu machen. Was machen wir? Ähm, wir machen zum einen Stickers, sind immer sehr beliebt und unsere Stickers ähm, haben den Vorteil, dass sie eigentlich keine Werbung für irgendwas sind, also für einen Hackerspace oder so, sondern sie sagen einfach nur, dass ähm, Telnet eben Klartext ist und man doch ähm, die Wahrheit sagen soll und schnell zum Punkt kommen soll. Das sind die Sticker der letzten Kongresse, ähm, den untersten, den könnt ihr bei uns auch noch abholen. 
Ähm, was wir auch anbieten ist, ähm, wir kaufen ziemlich viel bei AliExpress ein und den ganzen Kram schleppe ich immer mit hier hin. Und falls jemand hier unbedingt was basteln will, aber keine Teile hat, kann er die bei uns ähm, haben, ähm, wobei wir nicht versuchen, damit Gewinn zu machen, sondern nur die Leute zu unterstützen, die jetzt schnell was bauen wollen und keinen Bock haben, jetzt Ewigkeiten auf die AliExpress-Sachen zu warten. Ähm, dabei bieten wir aber auch an, euch zu beraten, wie man die Sachen sinnvoll verbaut. Also wenn ihr Probleme habt, wie kann man jetzt einen Motor an einen GPIO-Pin anschließen oder so, da seid ihr bei uns richtig. Was wir auch gemacht haben, wir haben mal ziemlich viele Leuchtdioden gekauft und die auf eine Tonne geklebt. Ähm, die seht ihr draußen und dadurch findet ihr uns. Das ist also unser ähm, ähm, Wahr Wahrzeichen, um uns schnell zu finden. Und das vielleicht für alle am interessantesten ist, dass wir eine Challenge, eine Challenge machen, die hieß früher mal Winkelkatzen-Challenge, heute nennen wir sie Tellnet-Challenge. Und wer die gewinnt, wer nämlich so eine Katze zum Winken bringt, die bei uns steht, der gewinnt ein T-Shirt. Ähm, vor zwei Jahren gab es das T-Shirt, wo Telnet Klartextreden draufsteht, danach gab es das untere und jetzt gibt es das, was ich anhab, allerdings in schwarz. Ähm, wir haben verschiedene Größen da und man muss nur die Katze zum, Blinken, äh, zum Winken bringen. Ähm, da kommt er einfach zu uns zum Stand, wenn er das machen wollt. Ähm, das ist ein Spoiler für die erste und die letzte Stage. Also in der ersten Stage seht ihr da so einen heißen Draht, den man schaffen muss. Die letzte ist die Katze da im Hintergrund, die ihr zum Winken bringen müsst. Und wenn er das schafft, dann gewinnt er halt das T-Shirt. Ähm, wir finanzieren das alles selber. Ihr könnt uns gerne Spenden geben und dann vielleicht auch T-Shirts kriegen um den langen Weg der Challenge zu umgehen. Ich glaube, der schnellste, wir haben einen Beta-Test schon hinter uns, den haben wir nämlich gestern gemacht, damit ihr den nicht machen müsst. Ähm, natürlich, wie es sich gehört, im Live-Test. Und ähm, zehn Leute, also zehn Gruppen haben es schon geschafft. Ich glaube, der schnellste hatte irgendwas mit sieben Stunden 40. Ähm, wobei einige sagen, sie haben zwischendurch auch geschlafen. Ähm, es spielt also keine Rolle, da ständig beizubleiben. Man kann das wie so ein CTF sehen, um praktisch ein T-Shirt zu gewinnen. So, das war's schon. Ich wollte ein bisschen mehr Zeit für andere geben. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Next up is unconventional tactics for online campaigning. Hey there. Um, my name is Lena Rieger and I am digital campaigner and designer for nonprofits um, across Europe. My topic today is uh, unconventional tactics for digital campaigning. And to start with, I just have a question for you. Did any one of you take an online petition within the last year? You wanna? Okay, nice. That's quite some engagement because um, online petitions are maybe the most um, important and most common tactic in online campaigning. But my question is, are there more ways to reach out to a target or maybe engage your supporter more? And there are plenty of them. And I'm just going to introduce a few of them today. So one thing you can do is to use localized data to personalize your issue more. Um, let's take the example of cyclist safety. If I give you the number of cyclist accidents for the whole country, let's say Germany, you might not be able to relate to that number because it's just too big. But if I break that down to your city, your region, maybe your neighborhood, you might be able to access this number and um, yeah, to relate to the topic. A simple implementation of this could look like just a simple online form where the supporter types in his postcode. This form is connected to data about um, cyclist accidents. You provide the number of the accidents happening in the intermediate surrounding of the supporter, and the supporter is able to relate to that number and engages with your topic. Um, we love engaged supporters because we can ask them for more. You could, for example, ask them to block your target's phone lines. So this tactic um, works like this. You have an engaged supporter. Um, of course, you provide the number of your target's office. Make sure that the target's office is staffed at that day. Um, and then you provide a phone script where you can list arguments um, your supporter could say to your, tar uh, to your target. Then you invite them um, to call your target's office. Um, and of course, this tactic is way more effort for your supporter, but also the effect is so much higher than just writing an email or signing an online petition, because your office, the office of your target, has to answer directly to that call. Uh, another tactic, um, ad busting your target's office. So um, ad busting works quite well at conferences or events where um, a very specific target audience is in one place. So let's sh say you want to campaign for cycle safety at um, an automotive conference like IAA. 
Um, what you do in advance, you prepare ads um, on Facebook and Google, um, which are telling about your campaign, about your topic, uh, and then you use IP targeting um, to show those, um, those messages, those ads, only in the block where the conference um, or the event is happening. So at the conference, for participants of the conference, it will look like these ads are all over the internet. Uh, and for you, it's a really cheap way to get a message across to a very specific target audience. Um, so last one is a sneaky one. Um, you could spoof your target's website. This also works quite well in, with events and conferences, because participants of conferences tend to Google the conference website to look at the program or to check the location. Um, and with um, targeted ads and smart SEO, you can lead those participants to another website, your website, um, that might look similar, but uh, has your message and your campaign on it. Uh, yeah, of course, it makes sense to always check the legal risks with those tactics. And I'm uh, very happy to talk about those. Thank you. Thank you. All the speakers are on time, and we have like six minutes right now of free time. But we'll continue with the next talk. TSDB mal anders. It's going to be a German talk, I think. Guten Tag, mein Name ist Zivilien. Ich erzähle euch was über TSDB. Ähm, was ist das? Time Series Database. Relativ simpel, ist halt eine Datenbank, einfacher Key Value Store. Der Key an der Stelle ist immer an den Zeitpunkt. Das heißt, es wird ein Wert zu einer bestimmten Uhrzeit abgespeichert. Und zu diesem Wert oder zu diesen Daten gibt es halt wenige oder keine Metainformationen. Und ähm, meist werden die Daten einmal geschrieben und danach nur noch gelesen. Klassischer Anwendungsfall dafür ist Monitoring. Jeder von euch kennt das. Ähm, Webserver anfragen pro Sekunde oder bei irgendeinem System CPU-Auslastung, RAM-Auslastung, Festplattenverbrauch, was auch immer. Früher sah das so aus: Das ist äh, der Klassiker, das RID-Tool. Äh, werden halt, wie man in der Grafik, Grafik sieht, zu bestimmten Zeiten abgespeichert, wie viele Bits da pro Sekunde äh, über die Leitung gegangen sind. Heutzutage gibt es das in hübsch, ist aber immer noch das Gleiche. Ich sehe zu irgendeinem Zeitpunkt irgendeinen Wert. Was kann man damit machen, wenn es nicht um Monitoring geht? Ich habe einen Use Case aus der Industrie dabei. Ähm, stellt euch vor, euer Energieversorger liefert euch nicht nur Strom, sondern ihr könnt euch auch suchen, wo der herkommt. Ähm, Energieversorger arbeiten grundsätzlich im 15-Minuten-Intervall bei allem, was die tun. Ähm, ihr kennt das sicher auch, die ganzen Smart Meter, die demnächst ausgerollt werden, erfassen euren Stromverbrauch im 15-Minuten-Intervall. Aber auch die internen Prozesse bei den Energieversorgern arbeiten alle im 15-Minuten-Intervall. Es stand teilweise sogar mal im Gesetzestext drin. Und mit MS-Cons gibt es einen Industrie-EDI-Standard, der auch auf 15-Minuten-Basis arbeitet. Wenn ihr jetzt die Möglichkeit hättet, euch auszusuchen, welche, welches Kraftwerk euch in welcher Reihenfolge beliefern soll, könnt ihr euch vorstellen, je nachdem, in welcher Reihenfolge ihr die anordnet, setzt sich euer Stromverbrauch unterschiedlich zusammen. Da die ganzen Daten im 15-Minuten-Intervall vorliegen, kann man die natürlich auch hübsch grafisch aufbereiten und sich den Jahresverbrauch anschauen, wo man dann sieht, dass im Winter weniger Sonne ist als im Sommer. Und wenn man dann rein, äh, reinzoomt, dann sieht man auch, dass tagsüber mehr Sonne als Nacht ist. Ähm, wäre ein schöner Use Case. Ist aber immer noch relativ langweilig, kommen wir zum kreativen Teil. Wer von euch war beim 34C3 und hat sich im Infrastructure Review diese wunderhübsche Folie angesehen. Das ist das äh, Dashboard vom NOC, das ist der Internet Traffic vom 34C3 und das NOC hat sich damals gefragt, was zur Hölle ist da passiert und hat nach einigen Grübeln rausgefunden, das ist Morse Code. Das ist Morse Code für 34C3, das ist jetzt zwei Jahre her. Letztes Jahr war jemand etwas, ja, hatte mehr Zeit, aber da geht noch was. Das ist das Dashboard von Eventphone, vom POC. Ähm, ich weiß nicht, wer von euch das schon mal gesehen hat, erreichbar unter dashboardeventphone.de. Der witzige Teil sind nicht die Sachen unten, sondern wenn man da oben den Mauszeiger hinhält. Weil das sind keine Bilder, sondern das sind Time Series Daten. Wie funktioniert das Ganze? Ähm, hier mal am Beispiel, wie man einen Pixel malt. Man malt sich oder man generiert sich passende Metriken stapelt die übereinander als Stack, 
färbt die dann passend ein, beziehungsweise sagt, dass die Farbe mal weg soll und dann hat man einfach einen Pixel. Um euch das mal an einem Beispiel zu zeigen, habe ich mir die Mühe gemacht und mal so ein paar Metriken generiert und die dann übereinander gestapelt und eingefärbt. Und weil das von Hand keinen Spaß macht, könnt ihr euch den Code dafür runterladen, ihr werft da einfach ein Bild rein, kommen hübsche Bilder raus, äh, beziehungsweise hübsche Graphen raus und äh, ja. Ich würde mich freuen, wenn wir auf dem Event jemanden finden, der zufällig Zugang zu einem etwas dickeren Internetanschluss hat und dem noch den Wunsch erfüllt, dass diesmal nicht gemorst wird. Vielen Dank. Let's go. Ja, yeah. this year I've worked on my master thesis and I came along a lot of problems. And uh, well, a lot of papers and articles focus on new results, but there's little reproduction. I um, had to reproduce uh, something, but there was no source code. The technical details in the paper, let's say they were almost non-existent. And uh, the framework that was used was kind of It was a known one, but it was really complicated. So basically I had to implement everything from scratch, which is not what should happen. So it cost me a lot of time. So what can be done better about it? Well, first, if you do any research, release your source code. It isn't that difficult, and it helps everyone else a great way. <laughs> Second, Every little detail, like hyperparameters, what other parameters are used, documented in the paper, and if that may be too long, then in the appendices, or some other way, but definitely document it, make it known to the people, because it shouldn't require uh, month-long uh, tries and writing to the author to get somehow understanding what actually was done. It should be inferable from the paper itself, um, so that's all you need to know. Third, use a common machine learning framework, for example, TensorFlow 2.0, there are others, but don't invent your own one. Um, maybe that's more intellectually challenging, but everyone else will hate you for it, so just don't do it um, and save everyone a lot of trouble and um, use a known one uh, so they can get to work and use your results faster. Fourth, write source code in package form. For example, in Python, which is used very often in machine learning, it's very easy. There's like the Python package index, so just prepare your things for that so you can upload it after you hand it in your publication so others can simply install it and have all the required dependencies in one command and don't need to search around and try to find how this thing can be run. Um, so only the... Um, data sets which are too large to put in as independencies have to be downloaded manually, but everything else will be ready. Um, and five, follow clean code rules. So, I mean, we all know this thing, you, we write something in school and then years later we can't read it ourselves. Well, in source code, while it's written with a machine, you, you can see the letters, but you don't necessarily understand them anymore. So just write cleanly. Um, search in the favorite search engine and um, just follow that. It isn't that difficult. Um, and uh, maybe follow a pledge, uh, hold yourself and others to these five rules. And if you're a journal editor or know someone who is, maybe don't accept publications that don't fulfill these five points. And if enough journals would follow that, then it would be adopted in mass very fast. So I think that uh, saves a lot of people a lot of time and doesn't take too much time from you. Thank you. Thank you. So next up is accessibility for adult autistics and at larger events. Yep. So, there we go. Uh, uh. Okay, hello. Um, so it's about autist uh, accessibility for autistics at large events. Uh, children are not my department, so it's only for adults. Um, the first thing I would like to encourage, oh, oh, why do I need that? Maybe we don't have autistics, you probably do. And 
considering accessibility helps everyone. Like a person in a wheelchair needs an elevator to get to the third floor, but everybody is happy for, to get to the third floor with an elevator when they're sick, for instance. So we are all disabled sometimes, and it helps the quality of your event if you consider those things. Um, tolerate odd behavior um, and make policies to tolerate odd behavior. Um, just don't, don't force people to be all the same. You know that, but make policies. Um, allow people to leave the room at any time. Some people want to smoke, some people want to pee, and some people want to be alone for a moment. Make it allowed. Don't force people into the party. Um, often autistics have trouble with sensory um, stimulation and social situations. Also, they know best what is best for them. It's just good to give people a chance to be alone, but also to give people a chance to be in a group in a way that's not overstimulating. For, for instance, here we have the Quiet Cube, which is like a quieter hack center where people can participate in the Congress, but not be too overwhelmed. Be predictable with your schedule. Um, for instance, like this, indicate when there are the social times so people can plan um, their stay and leave when they need. Um, autistics often really like to plan um, school year medical stuff. In a nutshell, problems with autistics is that they are overwhelmed. There is too much information. They are going, uh, and <laughs> so that happens, ha happens a lot to autistics and quite intensely. Meltdowns mean to be very angry, like to appear like in a rage, and shutdowns mean um, to not talk, to look unconscious or asleep. Um, those things happen. Don't unnecessarily touch people um, if you know that they are autistic, because touch, is also, touch can also be overwhelming and have a place where people can calm down. This is a bonus level. If you want to be all creatures welcome event, you can like print um, cards for people who cannot talk at the moment. It makes them feel more invited. Those cards might not fit everybody, but it's a, it's a good um, sign to, to tell them that they are invited. If you want to talk more, you can contact C3 Orti or me or come to the Quiet Cube and ask. We're happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. So next up is going to be disruption tolerant networking. Ah, we are also disruption tolerant here, delay tolerant especially. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Hi. Uh, slide. Vielleicht auf den Schwarzbutton gedrückt. What? So, warte mal. Um, no, no. So. Ah. That's good. Okay. So, some delay as our for the topic. So, um, today I'm going to give you a brief introduction into the world of delay or disruption tolerant networking and motivate all this with the DTN7 software or DTN7 Go to be uh, precisely. Uh, even today, we have a lot of situations where, uh, where you don't have some reliable uplink. For example, your internet access is blocked, or you don't have any infrastructure, for example, in the, uh, disaster scenarios. Also, you have transmissions from rural areas, for example, for your uh, sensor network, or if you have a digital Gipfel somewhere in Brandenburg. Furthermore, perhaps you're da somewhere in deep space, so you can't plug in your internet. The typical solution is some wireless mesh networking. But even nowadays, um, there are situations where your uh, mesh network doesn't fulfill your purpose, uh, doesn't help you. So here we have the um, a, a picture of a typical uh, mesh network as in your Fryphon community. So if you want uh, to establish a connection from the left to the right node, your routing algorithm just determines a path, for example, the dotted one, and you can um, ex uh, exchange packets. However, for TCP, for example, you need the round trip, so you have to send packets forth and back, forth and back. If, you, uh, if, you grow, uh, if your nodes are very far away from each other, this could take some time, for example, because you have such, uh, such low bandwidth. Furthermore, if your um, link breaks down, for example, like here, TCP doesn't work nicely anymore because TCP isn't designed for partition networks. Yeah. Um, in, the, uh, in real life, you don't have those uh, connected components. 
Um, for example, if you're in a disaster scenario and you're um, somewhere outside with your smartphone, you're in your group with your, um, your peer group, with your people, and you just have small mesh networks for yourself, but you cannot com uh, connect to the other ones. So it's always um, just small groups. Furthermore, people are switching bet uh, between these groups. So you have some kind of uh, mobility in this. So we have some um, network where you don't want any end-to-end -end connection, you don't want um, uh, extra network um, round trips or extra packets, and well, it must also work if it's not really connected and the nodes are moving. So that's where we're coming to delay or disruption tolerant networking. In DTN, packets are transmitted hop by hop, uh, hop by hop in a store carry forward manner. So packets are just exchanged from node to node when they when they're meeting. For example, opportunistically because they're just passing by or it's scheduled. For example, for satellites in space. This uh, looks like here in this example. Um, we have an, uh, these two groups as before, and the upper node wants to transmit some data to the lower one. Now, the upper node creates a package, and it's like it owns this package now, it has it, and it will transmit it to its neighboring nodes, and this time in the same component. Now, the node from the um, downer component moves up because it has some kind of mobility, gets a package, moves back, and now it's delivered. So um, this is not really possible with like the internet protocol and TCP, uh, especially TCP. So there are other protocols, for example, the bundle protocol, and there's currently an IETF draft, B, uh, DTN BPBIS uh, 17, which just describes such an architecture. It aims to obsolete um, this old RFC 5050. So uh, there you have the package looking like this one. You have a primary block with your metadata, like in your IP header, and then you have canonical other blocks. Um, at the end, you have a payload block where your um, yeah, payload is there, obviously, in this case, hello 36 c 3 and you can have other blocks, for example, a hop count block, which is the same like a hop count in the current version of the internet protocol. So you can just extend your bundles of transport. All these is implemented in our software we're going to present here. It's DTN 7 Go, and it's an, well, obviously, pres uh, implementation of this uh, delay tolerant networking with the bundle protocol. Um, it, uh, it has, uh, it's also a router, and it has an interface to be programmed for or to be uh, receive packages. Um, those bundles, as shown earlier, like the packages, can be exchanged over different protocols like TCP-based or the physical layer of LoRa. So we have small antennas where you can exchange um, the packets. Everything else is possible. We have an interface for this. Furthermore, before I just saw um, uh, said the uh, package exchange from node to node, but if you have a huge network, you want to have some kind of interland routing. So we have different routing algorithms as shown there. Furthermore, you can create these packages uh, with our API or just use our um, software as a library. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is Tesla Radar. Hello, my name is Martin and I'm talking about Tesla Radar in a very brief talk today. First a little bit of an introduction about myself. My name is Martin and I'm known for Bluetooth re security research and that is so long ago that I think most of you won't even remember. I'm having a hard time remembering, remembering this too. Um, and this is my 21st consecutive congress. And of course, I'm a Model 3 owner, and that's why I came into this research. So what's the issue? Some Tesla Model 3, uh, some Tesla models always transmit a unique ID via Bluetooth low energy. This is most, uh, most known, the Model 3, and most likely also upcoming models like the Model Y that implement the so-called phone key feature. This is a keyless go kind of technology that doesn't require a key fob but uses your own mobile in order to unlock the car and uh, allows you to drive the car without a key. And this ID that is transmitted continuously is, is required for this phone key feature. So the thing is that this ID does not change over time and you cannot turn it off. So it's a beacon you're driving around that everybody else is able to spot and um, 
can locate. So anyone can track vehicles without effort, and this is, at least in Europe, a privacy issue. And that could facilitate car theft, car crashing. I don't know if you know what that is. A friend brought that up to me. That's when people wait with their cars at intersections and wait for a well-insured car to come around the corner, which has no uh, right of way, and they just enter the intersection and the car crashes into their car and they make some money out of that. So that could be facilitated with that as well. Of course, speed measurement is something you can use it for. And worst of all is that um, it facilitates automated personal observation. So the situation at the moment is I wrote a letter to Tesla and, and told them that I believe this is a privacy issue. And uh, they replied back very friendly and very professionally that um, they have um, they they see that differently and they say that because there's so many automated license plate plate readers around in the country anyways so it doesn't really make a, a big difference if they would randomize any identifiers with their cars so ALPR, that's this license plate reader technology, that is an argument for the USA. It's a lazy excuse, some would say, but in Europe there's at least the GDPR. So <clears throat> if only there was an app for that, I thought, and there was no app that helped uh, addressing this issue. So I did this Android app, which is called Tesla Radar, and it's a little bit like Pokemon Go. <clears throat> It's, um, it has the intention, intention to raise awareness for the issue by spotting all these Teslas that you find when, when you wander around with this app. And it transmits it back to the server where a heat map is generated out of the locations of the detected cars. And of course, there's gamification in the app. And of course, this should lead to a situation where Tesla fixes the issue eventually. So please consider to install the app, share your data with the service, collect radar score, and enjoy gamification. And uh, please, please pay attention to the ads. It's a free app, but it's ad supported. And you don't have to be really interested in anything you see. Just give it a try clicking on it. So if you're still not convinced that you should go for the app, you're in very good company. Uh, the guy you see there is Thomas from the Netherlands. He's an electronics engineer, and he took it to the next level, in my opinion. He uh, installed a Tesla radar station next to a highway in the, in the Netherlands, and he's leading uh, the rankings uh, from then on. So he spotted by himself like 2,000 unique cars in about one month's time. <clears throat> and finally, that's the thank you. You see, it's already 16 different countries, 4,700 and a little bit different cars that have been spotted. And um, I would be really thankful if you joined in. Find me afterwards. I have stickers. And I will most likely hang around at the Telnet assembly. And if you want to talk to me, find me there. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is open source licenses. Yep. My name is Hong Phu Tang. I'm speaking on behalf of the Open Source Initiative. So um, I thought I'd start with a very quick English version of Jeopardy, as I couldn't play last night. Abbreviation 1000, OSI. What is Open Source Initiative? OSD. What is Open Source Definition? So Open Source Initiative is a global nonprofit organization that looks after the open source definition, 
We are also the community recognized body for reviewing and approving open source licenses. Open source definition. This is a document that published by us to determine whether a software license can be labeled as the open source certification mark or we call it OSI certified. This open source definition was originally derived from the DBN free software guidelines. So open source doesn't just mean access to the source code, but also the distribution terms of open source software must comply with the following criteria that you can find, can find on our website, opensource.org. GPL, MIT, Apache license, Mozilla public license, these are very popular open source license were approved by the OSI, but these are not all. If you go to our website, you will find close to 100 other open source uh, approved licenses. The core purpose of the license review process is to provide software freedom and to ensure that any approved open source license comply again with the open source definition. Some interesting facts about the process. All the licenses must go through a public review process. There is a community discussion on every single license on uh, a mailing list, and the decision process normally takes up to 60 days, and uh, an extra 30 days if there is a submission of a revised version. How to submit a request? You need to understand the open source definition and ensure that your license complies with it. Identify the submission type, uh, ensure you have an appropriate standing to submit such a request, join the, mail, the license review mailing list, and submit a formal request by just sending an email to that list. Go to opensource.org slash approval for all the details. Or you can also find me at the end if you have questions. Uh, I am at the critical decentralization in Hall 2, where all the colorful Asian looking tables are or you can also send me physical mails. I love them. And if you would on your address, uh, I would reply within the Congress. So that's it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, soldering workshops. Hi. Um, OK, so my first slide is where the hardware hacking area is. It's basically across the hall, um, right towards the bathroom on the left side if you go in the main door. So uh, how do I switch slides? Um, OK, so what is the hardware hacking area for? We basically have over 100 soldering irons, 30 of which are just dedicated to people um, wanting to solder anytime they want. You can bring whatever you want to solder. If you didn't bring anything to Congress that you want to solder, we also are selling kits mostly between about noon and five every day. And I also made a badge this year that is in my pocket. Um, basically, this little soldering kit, um, and it's by donation. And the donations will determine what my budget is next year. So if you think 600 isn't enough for Congress, donate more than what you think it's worth, because that will determine how many I get to make next year, because I'm not rich. <laughs> OK, so I'm also teaching a number of workshops. And my workshop that I'm doing tonight, tomorrow, and the next day is an introduction to Arduino soldering and programming. And it's basically one hour of soldering for surface mount and through hole soldering, and then one hour of learning digital input, digital output, analog input, analog output. And my goal is to stay there until everybody's shield works. And you sign up between 3 and 5 today or tomorrow. I'll be at the hardware hacking area. My other um, workshop that I'm doing tomorrow night is building this toy, which you can see what they're doing on the video. The one on, the one labeled recharge, you basically push it, 
and it's to recharge yourself, so to take a moment to just relax. Um, it was designed because a person in my hardware hacking space has a very anxious girlfriend who needs to constantly remember to just take a moment to calm down before giving a speech and so on. The other one is a, just a toy where if you push it with the right tempo, it will change directions or get brighter. And that's just to learn through hole soldering. And that's the slide in case um, the video didn't work. This is surface mount for terrified beginners. It's taught 10 different times during Congress. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the end of the kit sales area and the hardware hacking area if you want to take that workshop. There are still spaces left. Uh, this is sold out. There are still spaces for this workshop where you build a Ardu synth that's taught by Mitch Altman. So the first two workshops that I talked about with the recharge in the heart or the intro to Arduino, that's my workshop. The rest are just other people's. Um, this is where you build a music synthesizer, and there's still a few spots left. Um, the Maker Buino is sold out. I believe this one may have a couple spots left. And you basically, you build your own Geiger counter. Um, there's an air quality monitor workshop. And all of the information on how to sign up for the workshops given by other people are on the Hardware Hacking Area website, Wiki, and then follow all of their directions on how to get the kit and sign up. Um, and then there's two FPGA workshops. One is to build a stopwatch, and I believe it is free, and it's tonight, and you borrow the materials, which is how it can be free, because these are not cheap kits. Uh, if you want to buy the kit, you have to talk to the uh, workshop giver. And then there's also this uh, FPGA in your USB port workshop. And that's all. Thank you. And next up is exciting developments around Linux on phones. Very tiny. So. Thank you. <clears throat> so my name is Jan. Uh, I'm from the UbiPods project. So obviously I am not um, an independent source on this topic, but I wanted to use this opportunity to spread my propaganda anyways. Um, so Linux on phones. Why even bother? Yeah, because Android is not great. Um, there's many other reasons. I talked about this uh, last year, but this year I would just want to quickly remind you of some of the projects that are exciting right now. This is my personal opinion, so we won't target uh, all the projects they are in this area because there's a lot going on, actually. Uh, but I just want you to remind you of some of the things that are going to be interesting next year. First one, obviously, since I'm from UbiPorts, is Ubuntu Touch. Ubuntu Touch started out as the official version for phones from Ubuntu, from Canonical. Um, it was moved to a community project, which is UbiPorts, um, two years ago. Um, and it's still going strong. Uh, and I think that's an exciting one to watch. Uh, next one, obviously, you have to talk about KDE Plasma, uh, which is an adaption of, of, yeah, Plasma Mobile, which is an adaption of uh, KDE Plasma for mobile devices. Uh, very exciting. It's not entirely uh, meant for daily use yet, um, but they are really getting there. It's really amazing what they are achieving in, in, in fairly short time, uh, and it's going to be very, very interesting, I think. Uh, Post Market OS is a little different. They have uh, some different architectural approaches, uh, but they are truly amazing in what they do. They, they really challenge uh, what everybody is doing, and their focus is on improving the longevity of phones uh, so you can really use a phone that is 10 years old and it runs just fine. It's based on Alpine Linux, which is very, very lightweight, uh, so it works amazingly on, on really old hardware as well. Also not meant for daily use yet, uh, but we might see this, this change this year. Um, or at least in the next two years, maybe. Uh, so let's talk some hardware. Very exciting is the Pine Phone. Uh, the Pine Phone, P Pine is a company that originally made uh, kind of a Raspberry Pi uh, clone. 
uh, but they then moved on and, and made a laptop uh, and made a phone. Um, now I'm making a phone and it's, it's starting to ship now. Uh, it comes in at $150, it's, uh, it's free hardware. It's very exciting. I think, and it's, it's actual Linux on there, and, and the software is provided by open source communities, uh, so it's very non-corporate, I think, as, as non-corporate as it gets. If you want corporate, uh, this might also be something interesting for you. Um, so this is an uh, up-and-coming German startup. They are trying to make a phone entirely in the EU, I think mostly in Germany, actually. Uh, and they are experimenting with different alternative or mobile operating systems as well. Uh, so here you see Ubuntu Touch running on the prototype. Uh, so how do I install if I don't want to buy an expensive device? Because uh, most of these are, most of the supported ones are actually fairly old, so they are available on the cheap. Uh, so this is the UbiPorts installer. UbiPorts fairly early on said, okay, we need to make it as easy as possible to install on third-party hardware, so you can just pick up a Nexus 5 used for like 50 euros uh, on eBay and then run the installer. So the installer tries to make it as easy as possible so your grandma could install uh, Ubuntu Touch on her device herself without you uh, looking over her so shoulder. That's, that's the goal, really. Um, and now we're working on getting other operating systems in there. So if there's someone in the audience who's maintaining um, any Android alternative or even an Android uh, a derivative um, that needs to be easier to install, hit me up or go to github.com slash ubiport slash ubiport installer and uh, contribute your uh, installation instructions there. We created a config file format to make it really easy to describe what needs to happen, what the installer needs to do uh, to install on the, uh, on the uh, device. So you just have to activate developer mode and the rest happens automatically, basically. So that's it. Here are the links that we talked about. Uh, on, on the other side, you see how to get in touch. Um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with uh, all of this with, with Linux on mobile devices. Um, so yeah, take care. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next up is Hacking Ecology. Let's ja, go. Ja, hi, ich bin Mario. Willkommen bei Hacking Ecology Teil 2. Teil 1 war im vergangenen Jahr ein Talk von Theodor, der mit dem gleichen Titel quasi einen Talk gehalten hat. Und danach stellte sich die Frage, wie können Hackerinnen und Hacker bei verschiedenen Umweltprojekten etwas Gutes beitragen. Und dieses Jahr haben wir vier sehr konkrete Projekte beigebracht. Das erste ist Vidit. Da geht es einfach darum, Daten zu visualisieren. Denn sehr viele Daten sind frei im Internet verfügbar, beispielsweise von der NASA, von der Weltbank, von der UN, von verschiedensten Wetterdiensten. Aber die sind eben schwer abzugreifen, weil es verschiedene Datenformate sind, verschiedene Datenbanken, verschiedene Websites. Und hier können quasi wir helfen, indem wir ein gutes Visualisierungstool im Web bauen, mit dem solche Daten eben leicht ähm, visualisiert und anschaulich gemacht werden können. Denn grundsätzlich ist es so, dass es sehr viele besorgniserregende Trends in der Welt gibt. Beispielsweise die ansteigende Temperatur durch den Klimawandel, aber auch unser ansteigender Energiekonsum bei allen Energieträgern ähm, oder auch die Entwaldungsrate. Das zweite Projekt ist Snooze Against the Machine. Und zwar, ihr kennt das vielleicht alle, eigentlich wollt ihr etwas für die Umwelt tun, für soziale Projekte, gegen die kapitalistische Verwertungsgesellschaft. Ihr wollt die Revolution, aber manchmal wollt ihr auch einfach nur ausschlafen. Das ist zum Glück kein Widerspruch mehr, sondern... Was wir hier machen wollen, ist eine einfache App entwickeln, wo ihr jedes Mal, wenn ihr den Snooze-Button drückt, werdet ihr quasi einfach spenden, und zwar in eine Organisation eurer Wahl. Könnt ihr euch quasi frei aussuchen, welchen Betrag an welche Organisation, auch über vielleicht die Gesundheitsrisiken von Snoozing informieren. Also relativ straightforwardes Projekt. Und im Idealfall würden wir das Ganze noch mit Voice Command kombinieren, dass ihr morgens nichts mal mehr aufstehen müsst, um den Snooze-Button zu drücken, sondern ihr müsst nur noch quasi Shut up and take my money sagen. Der Wecker schaltet sich aus, spendet Geld und ihr könnt in Ruhe mit gutem Gewissen ausschlafen. Okay, das dritte Projekt, da geht es um Wurzelrizotrone, das machen Kollegen von mir in der Forschung. Wir wissen sehr, sehr wenig, was unterirdisch vor sich geht. Wie wachsen Pflanzen unterirdisch und gleichzeitig sind Böden eine der größten Kohlenstoffsenken in der Welt. Und was wir also machen wollen, ist dieses Wurzelwachstum irgendwie monitoren. Und was man also macht, ist eine Art transparente Röhre, eine Rizotron in den Boden einlassen und da eine Art Scannerleiste reinbauen, der sich einmal im Tag sozusagen dreht und das Wurzelwachstum um diese Röhren herum scannt. 
Äh, solche Geräte gibt es, kosten 20.000 Euro und funktionieren nicht gut. Und es ist eigentlich ein sehr einfaches Projekt. Wir wollen also einen mobilen Dokumentenscanner auseinanderschrauben. Den habe ich mitgebracht. Ähm, vielleicht kennt sich jemand aus mit Microcontrollern, mit 3D-Druck. Dann kann die Person hier gerne bei diesem Projekt mithelfen. Und das vierte Projekt, da möchten wir eigentlich hauptsächlich den Kontakt vermitteln. Das Grundproblem hier ist, dass jedes Jahr sehr viele Rehkits in dem Mähwerk von großen Mähmaschinen sterben, weil diese Tiere sich eben nur wegducken und nicht wegrennen in diesem jungen, ja, jungen Stadium. Und dann geraten sie quasi, wenn sie sich geduckt haben, in das Mähwerk, weil sie nicht weggerannt sind. Dieses Projekt Wildretter existiert bereits. Was man also macht, ist quasi Drohnen mit Infrarotkameras einsetzen, um ähm, diese Tiere zu finden. Und was jetzt gerade noch fehlt, ist einfach eine Navigations-App, mit der quasi das Bodenteam äh, dirigiert und na, äh, navigiert werden kann. Dass man also sagen kann, Person XY läuft jetzt zu Punkt P, 30 Meter nach Nordosten, hat das Tier gefunden oder nicht, um einfach diese Tiere dort zu retten. Auch eine relativ einfache, straightforward App, wo wir aber persönlich nicht helfen können. Aber vielleicht hat jemand von euch Interesse und möchte dort mitmachen. Wenn ihr grundsätzlich an einem von diesen Interesse, äh, Projekten Interesse habt, dann kommt gerne vorbei. Wir haben morgen äh, bei Wikipacker einen kleinen Space reserviert um 19 Uhr in der Wikipacker Bibliothek. Und wenn ihr diesen Talk online seht, dann könnt ihr uns auch gerne kontaktieren, einfach per E-Mail. Ähm, vielleicht auch später als Videoaufzeichnung einfach uns anschreiben. Ähm, wir freuen uns, wenn Leute von euch kommen und uns helfen wollen. Das sind alles äh, sehr viele spannende Projekte, finde ich. Danke. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Next up is make peace time, make peace with accounting, make peace time with accounting. Wait a minute, where is it? There we go. Make peace and time with accounting. Hello everyone. All right, so my name is Luis and I'm a, my day job is programming, but I'm tracking my finances with New Cash since uh, late 2016 and New Cash is an accounting software that has been developed since the late 90s, so it's pretty mature. And it's uh, free as in free speech and free as in free beer, uh, and it works in about any operating system. And for the accountants here, New Cash uses double entry accounting, which I'm gonna define a little bit next. So accounting lets you track money movements across accounts. And accounts can be, for example, your bank account, your checking or savings account, or a retirement account if you're in the US, or life insurance if you're in France, and I'm sure Germany has something similar. Or an account can represent where money is coming from, for example, your salary, or salaries if you work in different companies, or tips, or wages, any kind of wages. And our accounts can represent where money is going to, for example, food, transportation, services, for example, your fund bills, internet bills, any kind of bills. Or accounts can also represent how much money you owe, so any kind of debt a student loan, or taxes you'll have to pay at a, at a later date. And an accounting book is a collection of such accounts. So an accounting book centralizes all those accounts. And accounts let you like categorizes your finances. And centralizing and categorizing your finances has a lot of benefits. So for example, I think one of the most obvious one is to be able to track how you're spending your money. For example, one thing I like to do is to sort recurring expenses from non-recurring expenses, right? So recurring expenses are gonna be bills that are gonna be likely paid automatically every month. For example, my phone bill, uh, streaming services, internet bill, uh, electricity, whatever, uh, from other expenses. For example, traveling to CCC is something I do like, you know, it's a one-off operation. Um, and doing that may help you compress your budget. So, you know, like how much money you're spending every month by knowing how you're spending it, you can maybe like, you know, spend less or like, you know, uh, weigh, uh, you know, oh, I'm spending this much for streaming or like, but do I really like watch this many movies every month or something like this, right? Or do I need to pay this much for my phone bill? Um, doing accounting can also help you like spot hidden fees. For example, like banks, especially in the US, really like hidden fees. Like you pay for something and they'll add up a fee on top of it and they won't tell you, right? And by doing accounting, you can spot that very easily. And something I like to do, for example, is, you know, at the end of the year, you go to your banker and tell him, oh, here is how much I spent as fees with your bank. Can you do something about it? You know, it's like it gives you that power. Um, doing accounting also lets you catch mistakes very easily. For example, that happened to me. I made a check and six months later, it was cashed out for a completely different sum, much bigger sum. And I would have never caught that uh, without doing accounting because I would have forgot, forgot about it. It was like, and I would, I would have said, oh, that must be the right amount. Um, or also missed reimbursements, right? You like, 
loan some money to someone or like something, by doing accounting, you can remember, you can, you, you can see that you've given money out, or you can also do that to track how much money insurances are supposed to like, give you back. And overall, doing that can reduce anxiety about your financial situation. And that's why I'm saying you can make peace by doing accounting. Um, and a lot of things related to money can be like very anxiety inducing. For example, like debt can get, create a lot of anxiety. Taxes can create a lot of anxiety. And doing accounting like really helps with that. Um, also, you can like save time with accounting because um, by having like all your financial information categorized and centralized, you know any amount you might need for any kind of like computation or projection on your finances. Um, for example, taxes are very complicated in the U.S. And knowing all your different kind of income, whether they're like a salary or interests or dividends or tips, that really helps you like project and computer taxes, even though we have software to help you with that. There is other benefits that are not coming from centralization or categorization. Um, one thing that I like about accounting is, for example, you can actually like, you know, make banks compete with each other. You don't have to trust, like, you know, what people usually do is that like, one bank and that bank has some like, features to like, do that categorization thing. Uh, by doing it yourself, you can like, really have banks compete with each other if they have like, more interesting rates or, or fees. Um, and you can also like, not trust a single entity with all your like, financial information. Um, once something that your bank cannot do is track your cash expenses, right? You just like, get money from the ATM, spend it. The bank doesn't know how you're spending it. Cash is anonymous and it's a really powerful thing. Um, but you might want to track it with accounting. Uh, you can also track checks. Checks are still like, they're not really used anymore, but like, you know, oftentimes it happens. You have to use them. And it's really annoying when you make a check and then it's not cashed over for six months. You can track that with accounting and you're not surprised when a, ca when a check is being cashed out. Uh, doing accounting is a great first step towards uh, running personal or business finances. It's especially a great for running like nonprofit organizations or small businesses. It will also help you understand economy and politics. It's a great step towards that. There is also a few bad reasons for like I think not doing it. One is that accounting only serves rich people. I don't think that's true. I think that middle class people, people with less income, will also benefit a lot from accounting and from being able to like, see how they're spending their money and can plan for future projects better. Um, it's boring and takes so much time. That's completely true, but I think you're going to get that time back by doing that, by having more money for projects. And I don't think I'm going to have time for the last one, but X does it for me. Maybe you want to reconsider that. If X works for you, maybe you keep it. But um, you always have a conflict of interest with anyone handling your finances because they want your money, but you also want your money. And doing accounting yourself helps you resolve that conflict of interest. No one can like, manage your money better than yourself. And that's it. I will help you set up new cash at Congress, so feel free to contact me. And tomorrow, I'll explain how the Valley works. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as long as we are not over time, we can arrange something with the countdown. <laughs> so next up is uh, Duocracy Done Well. So hi, um, I am Merlin and I am a board member of Hackerspace Hen Ghent and I am going to talk about how we manage our community. So the first version of Hackerspace Ghent started 10 years ago and we had only two rules. Be excellent to each other and decide everything by consensus. We thought common sense would solve all other problems, but we were incredibly wrong. The, after four years, our Hackerspace was on the brink of destruction because of internal conflict. Uh, a lot of people were leaving for other Hackerspaces and there were even talks about forking the Hackerspace and stuff like that. So, as a last ditch effort, we started the Hack the Hackerspace workshops. Basically, workshops to create a system for our hackerspace, for our community, um, that gets the best out of people. So, as a result, we created the Hackerspace Blueprint. Um, this is a small book that explains how our community works and how we solve problems. Uh, and it's available online for free, it's also open source. And I hope that um, 
if you're interested uh, that you go to the URL hackerspace.design and that you read it in and that you can maybe use some of the ideas to solve problems in your own communities. This is the most important slide in my entire presentation, hackerspace.design. Go there in your browser and read the book. So I'm now going to talk about, we've been using this system for six years and what are some of the lessons learned. The first thing is a duocracy. Specifically about a duocracy is that you do not need the opinion of everyone who is affected by your action. If you are the person who does something, then you are the person who decides how it should be done. Even if you're not the most competent person, even if, if your, your, what you are going to do is not the best solution, you can still decide to do that without um, getting the opinion of everyone else. The second thing is interpersonal conflict. This is a big issue in communities. This is the, one of the main reasons why communities explode. We as human beings have this natural tendency to try to ignore interpersonal conflict as long as it doesn't uh, involve us ourselves. But this is a really bad thing because we hope that interpersonal conflict will solve itself, but it almost never does. So how do you actually solve this? The first thing is that you have to have people responsible to monitor and solve interpersonal conflict. Literally assign people them. In our hackerspace, this is the role of the board. The second thing is that if interpersonal conflict happens, first use the private talk pattern. Talk with the individuals privately and discuss the issues directly and without blame. And then after you've talked with everybody, take the, put them together and have also a private conversation with all the involved parties and moderate it. We've been doing this for six years and every single time when we tried it, it actually succeeded in solving the issues. But it's very important that you make people responsible to do this, otherwise nobody will. The second thing is rules and loopholes. So one of the issues with being a hacker is that you're incredibly good at finding loopholes. So running a hacker community using rules is an incredibly bad idea. What's better is to actually motivate people to do the right thing. Create a culture where everybody works in the best interest of the hacker space, not because they're forced to, but because they actually want to. If you see people who are not doing that, you can talk to them, you can coach them, and if they refuse to actually do that, just kick them out. These kind of people, whatever they contribute to your hacker space, they will take away more than they contribute. The third thing is meetings. Meetings is also a really big issue in a duocracy because meetings give power to the people with opinions. And we do not want that. We want to give power to the people who actually do stuff. So the best meeting is no meeting. Do as, as little meetings as possible. Thanks, this is the, the second most important slide in my presentation because it has the URL again. Go to hackerspace.design, send me an email, if you want to talk to me in person, you can also come to the HSBE assembly. And uh, I think tomorrow I will do a much longer talk in the assembly to explain more parts of the hackerspace blueprint. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is open laser tag. Hi, I'm Florian. I'm Jules. I'm Jules. Uh, we are building an open source laser tag system. Um, for those of you who don't know what laser tag is, it's like uh, catching each, each other but with light. It's the same technology like in your TV remote. And after playing laser tag uh, with some friends, uh, we we uh, sat together in Berlin at the Spree and thought, well, this can't be so hard to do this ourselves. And then we searched uh, on the internet if other people already did it, and of course there were lots, and uh, most of them did it in really complicated ways. And so we thought, okay, this is too hard for us, so we have to do it simpler. And so we went for the journey to build a simple open laser tech system. 
Yeah, and um, that, uh, we got some ideas about our system, what we wanted to achieve. It uh, should be cheap because we want to build um, a lot of taggers and give them to our friends to play with them. And uh, the technology should be accessible and flexible. And that's a system design we came up with. Yeah, um, starting at the bottom, you see the tagger. Um, which is basically the infrared communications hardware. And uh, on top of the tagger, uh, there is some um, Bluetooth. Uh, so the tagger is containing uh, um, ESP32 and some ER infrared um, components. And uh, they communicate via Bluetooth with your smartphone. For now, we have an Android app only, so we need somebody to do iOS stuff. And uh, the, uh, the app um, does most of the logic part, while the tagger is only basically a transmission layer. And on top of all of that, there is sitting the server, which is communicating uh, between all the different players. Yeah, that's how our first uh, prototyping looked like. Uh, that's the ESP32 you see here. and. Uh, only what you else need for uh, a tagger is um, this uh, microcontroller and uh, infrared um, LED and an infrared receiver and a lens to focus the infrared because uh, you don't want to have a like, widespread infrared uh, beam like in your TV uh, remote, uh, uh, but you want a very focused um, light stream to make it harder, of course, to uh, hit and, um, yeah, with your light. Uh, that was our next uh, prototype uh, built out of um, PVC uh, tubes. And, uh, yeah, you see the lens um, on the right picture. And on top of this black thing is an infrared receiver. And um, what's, uh, what I can say also about this, there's no uh, PCB involved in this. Um, so you don't have to, um, yeah, just, uh, you, you just can buy this comp the components and put them together and you have a tagger. And uh, our newer designs uh, of a tagger casing look like this. So they are 3D printed and more custom made. Yeah, and that's where we are at the, in the moment from the hardware side. Um, the software side of the tagger is also pretty far, so you can actually tag someone and he will get hit and will get a notification. And yeah, that's how we are, uh, how far we are uh, today. And now we can say where you can meet us. Yeah, uh, what uh, still is missing is like uh, the game logic. So we can't play a game right now, but uh, the technology works. So yeah, if you want to contact us, um, there's our GitHub repository and uh, our Twitter handles. Um, and uh, you can find us for the next half an hour outside of the, uh, the lecturing hall here at the LED palm tree. Yeah, we will be waiting for other hackers who want to play laser tech. We actually have a f um, yeah, pile of hardware with, and parts so we can actually build stuff today. Yeah, and uh, we also ask for a workshop slot and at the open hardware, uh, at a hardware hacking area. And uh, we will, but we didn't get a time slot yet, so we will maybe post it on Twitter. If you're interested in building your own tagger, um, come to there or meet us um, uh, in the next half an hour at the LD Palm Tree. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Then next up is binary analysis course. Thank you. Uh, today I would like to uh, talk with you about uh, a program uh, I've been uh, developing, not in the sense of uh, code, but as a course. So the table of contents, uh, it has three topics. Who am I? Uh, just a short introduction about myself. What is it? 
uh, and how can you access it? So first of all, something about myself. Uh, my name is Max Kerst. I go by the name of uh, Libra as a nickname. Uh, I'm the administrator or one of the administrators of the Malware Research Group on Telegram, on which I have a talk tomorrow. Uh, I'm currently working as a threat intelligence analyst. I previously worked as an Android malware analyst. Uh, I made some tooling for that, uh, and I write blogs on my own website um, about which, which this talk is. So what is this binary analysis course? So it's a free online course uh, that uses free and open source tooling. Uh, nowadays, you have a lot of uh, guides and helplines, especially for paid tooling. Uh, which is perfectly fine in corporate environments, but especially if you're starting out as a student or you're just new to the field, you don't want to spend so much money just to see if it fits you. Uh, there are great open source tools out there which work for free, uh, and this course uses them and focuses on them so you have a, a low-level entry. So it uh, has a really heavy focus on the how and the why stuff works. Uh, it doesn't jump to conclusions. You get explained every step of the way. Uh, and if you know something already, then you can just skip that part uh, and move on. So uh, the step-by-step -step approach is used in every article uh, where you get uh, a sense of how it works, why it works, uh, meaning you can repeat experiments that are being done in the course on other binaries you find yourself, CTF challenges you later on participate in, or anything else you want to put your hands on. So as a last kind of unique uh, part of the course. Uh, it does not contain images. I think the images uh, are great to use in some cases, uh, but it focuses me to clearly explain everything I want to in text, making it also easier for people to search back later on. Maybe you read an article and half a year later you think back, oh, I, I read about this uh, on this, this site and it was somewhere in this article. If you have stuff in images or in videos, it's really hard to find something back. But if it's fully written out in text, you can use the search function of your browser or any text editor you loaded my website in, and you can find things back. So some of the topics that are covered, uh, they start from the basics, starting from CPU architecture, how does it work, why does it work, uh, moving on to assembly language, as it's a core concept you need to know. You will also learn how to write some assembly and compile that to get a different view of what is the difference between compiled and decompiled code or disassembled, rather. Uh, you have multiple analysis methods for multiple file types. It ranges from a Linux DDoS bot that I analyzed to a browser plugin to mage card JavaScript. Um, so the uh, malware analysis in there is also for a variety of platforms. Like I said, it's based for the browser, for Linux. Um, there's stuff for Windows coming on. Um, but there's also more because you can, you can read my articles and you can read the analysis, uh, which I hope is really enjoyable. Uh, it's <laughs> at least I think uh, writing them is. But the, the question is, um, how do you continue then? Because I found some cool sample that I wrote about, but it's not as much fun to just keep on replicating the same sample. So what is also focused uh, within the course is how do you actually find new samples? Uh, where do you find interesting samples? And if you're searching for something really specific, where do you find this? Let's say you want a really specific version of a Mirai, then you need to search for this somewhere, somehow, uh, and you want to find this. And additionally, uh, recognizing uh, structures and patterns is really important, as they also come back into any language you use. If you have a specific type of obfuscation, you can view this in decompiled assembly code, uh, like pseudo C, or you can see it in JavaScript, in C sharp. In any language you come back to, you'll see certain uh, structures and patterns, like a for loop, a while loop. Um, so they're also discussed in great detail. So how can you access it? Uh, well, it's uh, on my website, which is on the screen right now. You can take a picture, wait until the talk is uploaded. Um, or remember it. Uh, I do tend to publish roughly at least one article a month based on how lengthy they are. Um, I publish announcement on, uh, annou announcements on Twitter beforehand uh, and also when something new, new comes out. Uh, so if you follow me on Twitter, you'll also be uh, up to date on that. Um, additionally, if you have feedback, suggestions, or ideas, uh, my Twitter DMs are always open. Uh, you can just send me a message uh, and uh, we can discuss anything. 
After this, I'll also be uh, somewhere around here in the area, uh, probably just outside the uh, exit of the Borg room. So feel free to, uh, to hit me up. All right, thank you. Thank you. So that, that concludes today's session. Uh, please give a big round of applause for all of the speakers who were here on stage today. Also, for having to deal with 24 speakers from different countries, a big round of applause for the translation team, please.